It's the sacred month of Damodar, the month of Kartik. And I will speak today on Krishna's, the beauty of Krishna's, of the Krishna conception of God. How Krishna reveals or manifests God's beauty in his supreme manifestation. Across the world, people talk about God. People, uh, there are people who, many people who believe in God, many people who don't believe in God. And different people have different conceptions of what God is. Bhaktivinoda Thakur, the prominent Acharya in our tradition, explains that there is one absolute truth, but that absolute truth is seen differently by different people. Just like if there be a huge mountain peak, by people in the east it will be seen differently, people in the west will be seen differently, people in the south will be seen differently, people in the north will see it differently. Now similarly, people from their cultures, their languages, their religions, they all see the one absolute truth differently. And although people may talk about one God, not everyone worships with the same understanding of God. So some people, for them, their understanding of God is simply a projection of their ego. That means that their, you could put, put God in double quotes, their God hates the people whom they hate. And so there are religious people and there are religiously fanatical people and there are religiously fanatical extremists. So some people say that our God is the only true God and our way is the only way to God. And some people are even more extremists and say, if you are not following our way to God, you are going to go to hell. And not only are you going to go to hell, we will help you get there faster. <laughs> so, some people have this idea where God is actually simply a projection of their ego. That means that I want to be great, so therefore my God is the greatest. And my way is the only way, so it's almost like they're claiming to have monopoly on God. And often people, who, when religion is used to boost one's own ego, then religion can become a very destructive force. It is not that religion is becoming a destructive force. It is the ego which will use any excuse for imposing itself on others. And religion becomes a convenient excuse for manipulating people's emotions. So there is an idea of a God who hates and punishes the wrongdoers and casts them into hell. Or there is maybe a more benevolent idea of God. If we go to <coughs> Rome, there is a famous chapel which is built by Michelangelo or which is decorated by Michelangelo. There is a Sistine Chapel. And there, there are depictions of God. So there is a famous image of God is extending his hand and the original man, Adam, is catching that hand. So the idea is God is extending his grace for human beings to be delivered. And there, they have depicted a God like an old man with a long beard. And that image is supposed to show how God is merciful and elevates all of us. But if you look at it from another perspective, uh, actually speaking, in that image, it is man who looks more attractive than God. It is, I have that image on my computer. I also have a PowerPoint actually. But maybe at the end I will just show it briefly. But the idea is that this image of God is not all that attractive. Now when European colonists, they came, to, uh, they came to India and they came to North India and they had all this woodwork and all these murals in the walls, wall paintings, where they saw this picture of a, this image of a small boy rolling on the ground or moving on his knees with a hand in some pot with some white material on it and his lips filled with white material. Uh, so they asked, who is this? They told, this is God. Is God? What is he doing? He's stealing butter. 
they got they got completely intellectually short circuited <laughs> this could understand first of all how could a small boy be god and god is supposed to be supremely moral why should he steal and if at all he has to steal why steal butter what is the value of butter you know why steal butter of all things <laughs> a butter is more like a delicacy butter is not even a stable item that you eat for food hmm? somebody might steal bread but somebody comes to your house and leaves the bread and takes the butter only i think that means this thief already has bread with him just what's butter <laughs> it looks very odd so they just couldn't figure out what is going on so the the bhakti tradition reveals a conception of god where god does not delight in his godhood god delights in the reciprocation of love there are two terms which are important to understand uh, if understand krishna as god one is leela and the other is yoga maya the word leela can be translated as play or pastime or sport leela now leela means that krishna as god has nothing to do he he is not obliged to do anything natasya karyam karanam cha vidyate natat samascha abhyadikas cha so there is there is no work for him to do he has no obligations and there is no one equal to him or superior to him who will oblige him to do anything so in the greco roman tradition they had the idea of god as an eternal stasis stasis means a static thing because their conception of god was that god is like a frozen perfection if somebody is a if somebody is doing painting in painting initially it's just a blank canvas and then you apply dabs with the paint put paint in different places and then slowly the image starts coming the beautiful painting starts emerging as the paint brush is applied but while the paint brush is applied at a particular point the the image the painting looks perfect a few dabs less a few touches less less with the paint brush and they don't look it doesn't look that good and there is also the possibility of over painting if too much paint is applied then also the paint doesn't look good so in the case of a painting the painting is perfect at a particular point before it is not perfect after it it is not perfect at one particular point it is the best that it can be so similarly their idea in the greco roman tradition was that god he is perfect and if he is perfect then why should he do anything so their idea of god was like a frozen perfection so god is the they said the god, god is the <clears throat> unmoved mover of everything he doesn't do anything at all why should he do anything because of him everything happens but if god does anything that would mean that actually before doing something he was incomplete in something now why do we do something we do something because we want something either we want to avoid something undesirable or we want to get something desirable and if god had something undesirable to avoid or something desirable to get then god would not be perfect and therefore they developed the idea that actually god has to be completely static and inactive to be perfect otherwise it would be an imperfection now baldev vidyabhushan is a prominent acharya in our tradition and he has written a commentary on the vedanta sutra called the govinda bhashya and there he describes what is leela so shri pad ramanujacharya is the prominent acharya of the shri vishnu tradition and he says leela is like play say a person may have their office and their job where they do their prescribed work but after that they come to their home and they may play so he says that for krishna there is no karma but leela is like his play there is it's not a prescribed duty but it is play the baldev vidyabhushan explains actually even when we play there is some purpose you want to enjoy play 
At one level there is winning, but even if we don't consider winning as a motive, we're just playing for fun. But still enjoying, getting fun is the purpose of play. But he says if fun is also a purpose that God seeks, then how can God be perfect? So he says Krishna's Leela is not like a play, it is like a dance. Now what do we mean by dance? He says when somebody is naturally happy, then they express their happiness by dancing. So dancing is not done to gain happiness. Dancing is done to express happiness. So similarly, Krishna's Leela is not done with any purpose. Krishna's Leela is simply to express his joy. So when Krishna acts, in his pastimes, it is simply an expression of his joy. And when somebody is joyful, so if we are very happy and everyone around us is just looking glum and serious, then either we, we curb our happiness or we cheer everyone else up. Isn't it? That incompatible state can't stay for long. Everybody is glum and serious. Oh, and the, say hey, somebody is speaking very happily. So it's like somebody that uh, like one thing in a room is at a high temperature, everything is at low temperature. Either the room has temperature has to go high or the person that thinks temperature has to come down. So, so Krishna is joyful. Therefore, all those who come in contact with him also become joyful. And what is the joy that Krishna is full of? That joy <coughs> is the result of love. So, Leela is the concept that Krishna acts simply to express his joy and to share this joy with others. Now, I move to the next concept, that is Yoga Maya. So, two concepts are vital for understanding Krishna's, the vision of Krishna as God. So, Yoga Maya is what I'll talk about now. When Krishna is full of love and he wants to reciprocate love with everyone. He wants to reciprocate and relish the reciprocations of love. However, there is a problem. The problem is that he is so big. He is as I said, Asamurdhva. There is no one equal to him or to speak of anyone greater than him. And then when there is too much of a power asymmetry between two people, then when there is too much of a power asymmetry, then there cannot be a very relishable relationship. If we come to know that the person we are talking to is the head of state of America, of Canada, then we will be a little apprehensive or even more if you consider if we are in a state which is ruled by a dictator and we are talking to the dictator, then we know the dictator has absolute and arbitrary power in us. So we will be very reserved, we will not be able to express ourselves naturally. So, for understanding God, there are two aspects to be understood. God's greatness and God's sweetness. Now, both of them are important for developing devotion. God's greatness induces submission. If you understand, the person I'm talking with is a very, very powerful person. Then if they tell us to do something, we'll do it. If we are having some sickness and the, we come to know the person we are talking with is a top doctor in the country, then if they tell us something, we we'll submit. So awareness of God's greatness brings submission. And most of the world's literature focus on greatness, on describing the greatness of God by which we can learn to submit to Him. However, as I said earlier, appreciating someone's greatness creates also a sense of asymmetry. This person is so great, so how can I, how can I relate normally? Sometimes we are a little inhibited when we are dealing with some very big person. So then there is another aspect of God, that is his sweetness. And God's sweetness induces affection. So God's greatness induces submission. God's sweetness induces affection. And authentic devotion is a combination of submission and affection. 
if there is only submission or only affection then that is superficial devotion there is only submission okay god is so great we are not really, we are almost treating him like a big power not really a person but if there is only affection then we don't we don't realize god's position so for most of us we have to go on a journey journey where right now we are all filled with our own greatness i am so great or how great i am i'll reveal in future to the world <laughs> that's more of an idea i'll do something special and then everyone will know how great i am so right now most of us are filled with our own greatness but as we grow in devotion we start becoming filled with krishna's greatness oh i am nothing in front of krishna let me just devote myself to him and so initially the scriptures focus a lot on inducing an awareness of krishna's greatness within us but as we move forward the bhakti tradition especially the conception of krishna in vrindavan focuses on his sweetness and though for for us it's important to become aware of god's greatness but for those who are already devoted to the lord they are already well connected with the lord for them and the awareness of his greatness goes down and the awareness of his sweetness rises and that is how devotees are able to relate with him as persons so the vrindavan vasis the devotees in vrindavan they they are not actually conscious that krishna is god so they are they are very deeply conscious of krishna but their consciousness of krishna is oh, krishna is such a lovable cowherd boy among us we all love him we are all ready to give up our life for him he is one among us such a special person so this this awareness they don't think of krishna as god that's why yashoda mai she thinks that if i don't feel krishna krishna will die krishna will become weak it's my responsibility to feel she is anxious so she is anxious that i am able to feel krishna so in that sense she if she thinks that krishna is god he she is feeding me he is feeding me he is feeding everyone then where will be the maternal affection over there so for that maternal affection for god to relish to share his joy with others in a mood of personal reciprocation there is the there is the sending to the background of the awareness of his god of his greatness so we could say that uh, sometimes if i tell people i was giving a class in india and i said that the brajwasis don't accept krishna to be god and one person in the audience asked us i also don't accept krishna to be god <laughs> <laughs> so now they do not at the same level so there is maya and there is yoga maya or you could say there is maha maya so when people materialistic or atheistic people don't accept krishna as god they are covered over by the force of illusion maya means that which is not so most of us in the world are covered by maya by which we think of these worldly things worldly things as very attractive and god as not very attractive or maybe not so relevant or maybe not even existent so most of us are covered by mahamaya and we need to become aware of krishna's greatness but in the spiritual world there is another power which covers devotees and that is called yoga maya now the word yoga maya is intriguing because the word maya as i said means illusion and the word yoga what does it mean connection connection of the soul with the supreme soul so in a sense illusion is what disconnects us and we want to get connected so the word yoga maya refers to two opposite ideas so in english this is called uh, there are various figures of speech in sanskrit they are called as alankar shabda alankars there are two kinds of ornaments there is shabda alankar where the words are used in a playful way and there is arthalankar where there are there are meanings which are striking so this is a uh, this is a viruddha 
arthalankar that means that is there is a there are two words which are in opposite sense in english this is called as oxymoron so well known oxymorons can be you are a, you are a brilliant fool are you brilliant or are you foolish what do you mean you are brilliant fool or somebody is it said that like suicide is an act of courageous cowardice <laughs> why courageous cowardice because actually to end one's life requires courage sometimes some people get frustrated i am going to commit suicide and then they go on top of a bridge and they are about to jump down and they look down at the river and they think next time <laughs> and they come back so to end one's life requires courage but when one is ending one's life because of the fear of the problems that one is facing and the fear that i won't be able to deal with this problems then that is cowardice so courageous cowardice are opposite ideas but the opposite ideas are brought together to convey a deeper meaning that is called oxymoron so similarly yoga maya is a oxymoron in the bhagavatam the 29th chapter it is described <coughs> that in the first verse itself 10.29.1 the word uses yoga maya so when the bhagwan pita ratri when krishna sees the beautiful autumnal lights he takes shelter of yoga maya to perform his leelas so yoga maya is oxymoron so normally illusion takes us away from krishna maya takes us away from krishna yoga connects us with krishna so yoga maya is the illusion that intensifies connection the illusion that intensifies connection so the vrajavasis like yashoda mai are in yoga maya so for your yashoda mai to think that krishna is my child and i need to feed him i need to discipline him this is this is a manifestation of yoga maya she is in maya she is illusion to think that krishna i am disabled with krishna but this is a illusion that intensifies her connection with krishna that deepens her devotion for krishna and thus this is anukul to bhakti this is favorable so when krishna performs his leelas at that time everyone in vrindavan is in yoga maya everyone means all the vrajavasis not the demons who come there they are in mahamaya they are in illusion and not like illusion like everyone of us they think krishna is ordinary and and kill krishna but in krishna reveals how he is extraordinary so with these two concept concepts now first is leela that krishna acts for expressing his joy and yoga maya that there is a covering of the awareness of krishna's divinity of krishna's greatness so that there is a reciprocation of love with this background let's now try to understand the damodar leela we have the beautiful depiction of mother yashoda binding krishna so the damodar damodar leela is described in many different uh, poetic compositions in the 10th canto of the shrimad bhagavatam this is described also in <coughs> chapters 10 11 primarily speaking and there are many poets who have written about this so there is satyavrat muni who has written the damodar ashtaka and i'll discuss the first two verses to understand what is the to understand this appreciate this past time better so namami ishwaram sachidananda roopam so because this past time is going to depict god's sweetness it is going to be a small child running from his mother so right in the beginning satyavrat muni ashtaka I reminds us that don't think this is ordinary child is ishwara so i offer my obeisances to that ishwara sachidananda roopam he is the supreme lord he is not an ordinary person namami ishwaram sachidananda roopam lasat kundalam gokule bhajamanam so he is wearing very ornaments and he is lighting up the abode of vrindavan now when krishna wears ornaments he is all attractive he doesn't need ornaments to become beautiful rather he beautifies the ornaments bhushanam bhushita he is the ornament of all ornaments lasat kundalam gokule bhajamana yashoda bhiyo lukha ladhavamanam 
ಪರಾಮೃಷ್ಟಮತ್ಯಂತ ತೋದಂತೆ ಗೋಪ್ಯ ಆ್ಯಂಡ್ ಇನ್ ಫಿಯರ್ ಆಫ್ ಮದರ್ ಯಶೋದ ಹಿ ರ್ಯಾನ್ ಅವೇ ಧಾವಮಾನ ಬಟ್ ಆ್ಯಂಡ್ ಪರಾಮೃಷ್ಟ ಯಶೋದ ರ್ಯಾನ್ ಫಾಸ್ಟ್ ಮೀನ್ ಅತ್ಯಂತ ತತ್ತೋದೃತ್ಯ ಗೋಪ್ಯ ದ್ಯಾಟ್ ಗೋಪಿ ವಿತ್ ಗ್ರೇಟ್ ಎಫರ್ಟ್ ಕಾಟ್ ಇಟ್ ಸೊ ದ ಪಾಸ್ಟ್ ಟೈಮ್ ಇಸ್ ಅಟ್ ಒನ್ಸ್ ಕೃಷ್ಣ ವಾಸ್ hungry when his mother was churning butter so he came and started tugging at her sari the small boy baby at that time just barely learned um, just recently learned to walk and run so he and mother she saw him and she said oh krishna she started she knew that krishna is hungry so she started feeding him but then she had also kept milk on the stove so <clears throat> at that time <clears throat> you know <clears throat> she had she she was actually churning milk but she was also heating the uh, heating the milk as well so she was doing multitasking even at home and at that time she suddenly put krishna aside because she didn't want the milk to milk to go away and she ran to uh, protect the milk from spilling but krishna suddenly got angry it's like suppose you know say after this suppose after this program there is prasad well no suppose prasad is there <laughs> 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 but suppose there is some very delicious sweet and some nice prasad is there and you are savoring that feast you have close your eyes and you want to take one more handful and you find there is nothing there look the plate has disappeared what happened you will get annoyed you will get angry so for krishna it was like that he was relishing his mother's breast milk and suddenly his mother left him. so he got angry and as he got angry he decided that he is going to express anger so he is got angry and looked around just broke the pot with the father was churning his milk churning the milk he was still angry but he also this there's anger but there's also a little fear coming so we are all driven by different emotions at different times so his anger was there but fear had also started coming initially it was only anger so just broke whatever came here but then fear started coming so he was running somewhere else trying to run to some other room and he ran to some other room his anger was still there and his hunger was also there so he started breaking other pots he climbed out on grinding mortar and started reaching out to the pots and started breaking them and then the in rindavan there will always the pets who were the associates of krishna who were they the monkeys yes they immediately came and krishna had fun feeding the feeding the monkeys and as he was feeding the monkeys he was also worried the mother ishda kamal on so he was looking here looking there so he had come from this side so he was looking there looking right so mother ishda came from there she saw krishna immediately she ducked behind the wall and then she sneak back all the way back and she came from right from behind krishna so krishna was looking to the left looking to the right but mother ishda came right behind him and as he came behind him she came behind him the monkey is who krishna was feeding suddenly their mouth fell open the eyes became wide in the lama and krishna and what happened look behind he saw mother ishoda jump down and started running away and he said running and mother ishoda where are you running stop krishna and he was running running he knew that now by this time the anger had disappeared and the fear had come up with him he knew i had done some mischief some terrible mischief he said running 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 so ishoda ran after him so oh, she kept running running and that supreme lord who no one can reach but the rishuda finally reached and caught him yashoda bhiyoluka ladha umana now bhiyoluka it was in fear of mother yashoda that krishna ran so till now i talked about one aspect of yoga maya yoga maya is that force by which the devotees are no longer aware of krishna's god so that they can love him naturally but yoga maya has another aspect also that even krishna is not aware of his god because if krishna knows i am god then he cannot relish love over there he also wants to relish love and he cannot relish that love unless he takes up that role fully so yoga maya not only covers the pure devotees yoga maya covers krishna also 
And that's why the Bhagavatam in 10.29.1 says, Yoga Maya Upashita. Krishna took shelter of Yoga Maya. Krishna took shelter of Yoga Maya. The Bhagavatam is it discusses 10 subjects and describes how all the various aspects of reality, including the prominent nine subjects that the Bhagavatam is discussing, all of them are ashrut, all of them are sheltered, and Krishna is the ashray. Krishna is the supreme shelter of all these objects. But the Bhagavatam culminates in a pastime where that Lord, who is the shelter of everyone, takes shelter of something else. He takes shelter of yoga maya. So, when a player, when, when any actor is doing any particular role, <coughs> somebody might be a millionaire. And as a millionaire, they've got to get together with all their family members and relatives. And then they are all just having some play. When they are when they're enacting a play, this millionaire may take a role of a beggar. And as a beggar, he may say, oh, please give me some arms. I have not eaten for three days. Now they have eaten three times on that day only. <laughs> but if the drama is to be real for them and for others, then the players in the drama have to enter into that role. And similarly, for Krishna to relish the love of his mother, he has to enter into that role. And to enter into that role means that Krishna forgets that he is God. And he thinks, I'm just a small child. A small child, I am trying, I am, she says that I have, to, I have committed an offense, my mother is upset with me, I have to run from her now. And he's running. So Krishna, by Yoga Maya's arrangement, forgets that he is God. But again, his forgetfulness is not like our forgetfulness. Even when he forgets, he's still any time capable of becoming free from his forgetfulness. And that's why we will see towards the end of this past time, Mother Nishida ties up Krishna and then she goes away. And then Krishna sees, oh, these trees, they're actually Alakur and Manikri. And my devotee, Narad Muni, had promised, had promised that I will deliver them. And now he is a tied up small child. But he remembers. So Krishna's forgetfulness, if at all there is forgetfulness, that is not like ours. It is just according to his will for enhancing his pleasure. And when his Leela, when his pastime requires that he remember, he will immediately remember. Effortlessly. So we could consider a metaphor for explaining this. That... So if there is, if there is a play being performed, then then in a play, now nowadays plays are not that common, now movies are there, but still there are plays, there are live performances there. Okay. Now in plays, there is, there are actors, and behind the actors there is the director. Now quite often, the actors are much more well known than the director. The actors may be more famous, more wealthy, but within a particular play, the actors will act as directed by the director. So in Krishna Leela, Krishna is like the actor. He is a central actor. He is Nata Shiromani, the crest jewel among all actors. And Yoga Maya is the director. So Krishna acts according to Yoga Maya's direction. That means the supreme controller is controlled by Yoga Maya. However, the director directs according to a script. And the script is written by a script writer. So in Krishna Leela, Yoga Maya is a director, but she directs according to a script. And the script writer is Krishna. <laughs> So Krishna becomes controlled by, by Yoga Maya according to his will only. So in this way, 
Krishna is simultaneously in control and not in control. So even when he is forgotten that he is God, still everything is happening according to his will. So Krishna is, this is achintya bheda bhed. Simultaneous oneness and difference. Krishna is supreme and still he is just a small helpless child. So bhiyo nukala. Krishna is fearful. The next line is called Rudantam Muhurnetram Yugmam Rujantam Karambhoja Yugmena Satanka Netram Muhushwasa Kampa Trirekhanka Kanta Stitta Kraimam Damo Daram Bhakti Bhattham So it said that Krishna was crying so much. You know, with both his eyes, tears were coming out and he was crying and he was rubbing his eyes. And not only was he crying, his breath was coming out very fast because he had run so much. That also had caused his breathing to go high. And now he was fearful. That also was causing his breath to go high. Yet to go high. And then finally, Mother Yashoda tied Krishna. And she tied him Bhakti Bhattam. She tied him not with the ropes, but with her devotion. So Krishna, <coughs> here in this particular pastime, reciprocates love with Mother Yashoda by acting in a way that is just what is going to intensify her love for him. And that will intensify the devotee's appreciation of his sweetness. So Krishna doesn't delight in Godhood. He delights in the reciprocation of love. And Bhakti Bhattam, what this means is that in the kingdom of God, God doesn't, God is not the king. It is devotion that is the king. That even God becomes bound by devotion. So more than the kingdom of God, Golok is actually the kingdom of devotion. Bhakti is supreme. And that same bhakti is what is accessible to each one of us. We all are going through our lives and we all have different desires which are not yet fulfilled, different obstacles which are coming in our life, which we would <coughs> want to have them removed from our life. And yes, at a practical level, we have to deal with these. But at one, another level, the problems in life are endless. And one problem will go, another will come. And another will go, another will come. One of the, big, the, one of the greatest causes of unhappiness in today's world is our belief that everyone else is happy. <laughs> so we see smiling faces on TVs and billboards and movies and we, get, we have get togethers and parties and places and everybody seems to be laughing, everybody seems smiling, everybody seems to be happy. So actually this belief that others are happy makes us unhappy. But now, it doesn't mean that we want others to be unhappy. It is just that the fact of life is, we alone are not suffering. Everybody has problems. At one level, we do have to work to combat problems practically. Whatever problem has come, we deal with it practically. But we don't let our entire energy get consumed by that. There is, there is one a part of our energy we use for transforming the situation. That is what we do practically. And devotion can help us in doing that also. Devotion, connection with Krishna can give us inner security, can give us inner strength, can give us inner clarity. By which, whenever problems come, we will be able to transform, respond to the situations positively. Transform them positively. But a major part of devotion is not transforming situations, but transcending situations. Rising to a higher level of consciousness. Ultimately, life's perfection is not to have a problem-free life. Because even if you come free from problems, still old age, disease and death are going to come. Life's purpose, ultimately, is to attain Krishna. To attain devotion for Krishna, to become absorbed in Krishna. I will conclude with one point, that this pastime where Krishna becomes tied by his mother's love, Bhakti Baddham. So the next verse is Taddi Yeshi Taddeshu Tairja Tattvam Puna Premanta Samshala Vrindi Vande. So here Krishna, in a very dramatic way, is differentiating between 
punya and bhakti punya is piety when we do punya the hope we are doing something materially good and we hope to get something materially good in return that's good but we are meant to we can do much better bhakti is not about doing something which is materially good bhakti is about connecting with krishna bhakti is about developing our devotion to krishna and when our devotion to krishna gets developed then we go beyond what is materially good and beyond what is materially bad and we focus on krishna we become absorbed in krishna and in that absorption in krishna is life supreme security is life supreme satisfaction because whatever may happen at the physical level if we are absorbed in krishna we will be sheltered internally and ultimately we will be elevated to the spiritual level of reality so this past time describes that we may go to god sometimes to get some things from god so in punya we see god as the source of desirable things oh i want a problem free life i want wealth i want talents i want this result so we see god as the source of desirable things and that is good to see that god is the ultimate source of desirable things that is that is a pious way of looking at god but the spirit, spiritual way of looking at god is not that god is the source of desirable things god is himself the supremely desirable thing so if i get god then i have everything i don't need anything else and that's why uh, in the same namadrashtakam the fourth verse it is said that idam te va purnatha gopala balam sada me manasya avirajita ki manmi what if i can always remember this beautiful face of gopal this god the supreme lord who is out of love tied up by his mother how much love does he have? how loving he is if i just can remember him always i don't need anything else kim manye what else is needed so for us this is the gift of the bhakti tradition this vision of an all attractive all loving god and with this vision when we practice bhakti we understand that krishna's greatest gift is krishna himself krishna's greatest gift is krishna himself if he can enter into our hearts if he can become the constant presence in our consciousness in whatever life may send our way we will be able to face it not only will we face it but we will be able to grow through it will grow in our devotion grow in our inner strength ultimately will attain life supreme destination we will enter this world of yoga maya where love reigns supreme and where there is eternal ecstatic joy in the loving absorption in krishna this is the gift that we aspire for when we practice bhakti and especially in this month of damodar when krishna it is the month of radha rani the topmost devotee of krishna so her mercy is profusely available in this month in this month if we appeal to her for with devotion she can enrich our hearts with a devotion that will be life's supreme gain so i'll summarize i spoke today about the theme of how krishna is the most endearing vision of god in the some people think of god as a source of a punisher and that their god is simply a projection of their ego god hates those whom they hate so they sectarian and narrow minded vision of god some people may have they think of god as a very as a as a wise old person he has wisdom but he doesn't have he's not very attractive but the bhakti tradition reveals a vision of god where there is both his greatness and his sweetness so becoming aware of god's greatness brings submission becoming aware of his sweetness brings affection and submission plus affection brings authentic devotion so for people who do not accept that krishna is god they are in mahamaya people who are rajavasis who are very advanced devotees they are so subsumed so absorbed in god at now their uh, awareness of god's greatness will actually come in the way of their reciprocating love with him so they are covered by yoga maya yoga maya is the i talk about oxymorons 
it is the illusion that deepens connection before that i talked about leela leela is not just a sport that god engages in to get pleasure but rather it's like a dance which is a expression of his pleasure and he engages in his perfection is not a frozen perfection like a perfectly painted painting it is it is a dynamic per- per- perfection based on the reciprocation of love with his devotees and for reciprocating love he covers his devotees so that they are no longer aware of his godhood and then the power asymmetry between the two gets decreased between god and his devotee gets decreased in fact not only decreased in this past time we see it is reversed but ishoda is stronger than krishna and she ties krishna <coughs> and then i talked about how krishna himself also gets covered by yoga maya but he is he forgets that is god by his own will so yoga maya, krishna is the actor yoga maya is the director but krishna is the script writer and krishna experiences fear when the devotee is chasing him but that's all so that there can be more intense expression of affection and devotion and reciprocation of love in his past times and mother yashoda gets tied by not her ropes that she is using but by she mother yashoda will tie krishna by the rope of her devotion so the kingdom of god is not god who is the king it is devotion that is the king when god gets tied by devotion and then i conclude by talking about the punya and bhakti in punya we see god as a source of desirable things and we worship god so that he will give us many desirable things in bhakti we see god as a supremely desirable thing so we may want to transform situations in our life and we pray to god to give us help in transforming the situations that is fine at a practical level but we understanding that everybody has problems in life the bill notion that others are happy is what makes us unhappy so everybody has problems we don't let our entire energy get consumed by faith by combating problems but we focus on transcending situations see god is supreme desirable and whether there is positivity negative in or in my life i focus on connecting with krishna and that connection with krishna through devotion will give us absorption in eternal ecstatic absorption that is life's supreme perfection thank you very much hare krishna Yes, please. Thank you. Mm-hmm. So, uh, you are from you. You mentioned that Krishna experiences fear. Krishna is also like the body is worshipped with lotus feet to get rid of fear. So yes. Really yes. So, if Krishna experiences fear, then how do we understand that devotees worship Krishna to become free from fear? So, there is fear that is caused by forgetfulness of Krishna. भज हु मन श्रीनंदनंदन अभय चरण रविंद सो देर इज फियर विच एज अ इमोशन इन द मटीरियल वर्ल्ड वेन वी आर नॉट अवेयर दैट कृष्णा इज ऑलवेज इन कंट्रोल दैट कृष्णा इज ऑलवेज आर वेन विशर कृष्णा इज आर सुप्रीम शेल्टर देन वी फील फियर एंड बाय बिकमिंग कॉन्शियस ऑफ कृष्णा दैट फियर विल डिक्रीज सो देर इज फियर कॉज बाय डिस्कनेक्शन विथ कृष्ण and that fear is removed by connection with krishna but ev- almost everything that is present in the material world things that are present in the fundamental foundational level they are present in the spiritual world in their purity so fear is also a rasa bhaya bhayanaka fear is also a rasa in the in bhakti so fear can intensify devotion so krishna mother yashoda remembers krishna more when she thinks he is he's in trouble she fears him she fears not problems but she fears for him so for him means for his well being and krishna also when he feels fear that fear actually intensifies the reciprocation of love between him and his devotees so we could say there is a x axis y axis so in the y axis below zero there is 1 2 3 4 5 6 but it's all minus 1 2 3 4 5 5 5 and there is on the positive axis there is 1 2 3 4 5 6 5 5 5 so the emotions that we of fear another emotion that we experience in this world they are on the negative axis 
and by the practice of bhakti we will come we will become free from these materialistic emotions or emotions that come from material consciousness and we will come to the level of zero but being at zero is not the perfection of life we want love and love involves a panorama of emotions uh, 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 and one of the emotions within love is also a kind of concern for our loved ones that is fear so so that is these are emotion in the positive axis so the emotion of fear in this world often puts us in greater illusion if it doesn't make us take shelter of krishna but in the spiritual world when there is fear that actually intensifies the devotional reciprocation between krishna and his devotees so in krishna is fear for krishna feels fear it is not like our fear it is simply an ornament for recipro- for intensifying the reciprocation of love that's why at one moment krishna is fearful and next moment but deva murti that although he is bound he liberates those who are bound nalakur and manave anagri they are bound in material existence and krishna is bound by ropes but krishna frees them so his fear is transcendent and simply meant to intensify the reciprocation of love between humans okay thank you so any other question yeah Okay. Now, when Brahma was under illusion, was he, was he in Yoga Maya, was Brahma in Yoga Maya or Maha Maya? It's very difficult for us to know who is in which illusion. Now that we can all start judging each other also. If somebody may do something wrong and say, I am Yoga Maya, you don't understand me. <laughs> and somebody may be doing something special for a particular survey, something unusual. and they may be actually doing it with a very sacred purpose but uh, we may think this person is going to maya so we don't know so generally the best way to know is we can't look into anyone's mind so we can see by the result so in the case of brahma vimohan leela at one level we can say that the result was that krishna manifested his greatness that krishna expanded himself so many forms and because he manifested himself he may manifest expanded himself in so many forms and he manifested his divinity even when he was seeming to this uh, manifest his childhood past times so in that, that terms it furthered krishna's past times it's also said that during that time one year when krishna had become all the gopas that's where the time when all the gopis were married to the gopas so all the gopis that sense are married to krishna only and thus all the gopis were krishna's wives and also at, at another level we see that at the end of it all brahma ji offers profound prayers of wisdom and repentance so even if we say that it was in mahamaya but still the result of it was that he became more devoted so sometimes in our spiritual life we may succeed in doing some succeed in acting in the right way sometimes we fail to act in the right way so even if we can't succeed in krishna consciousness then we can fail in krishna consciousness we don't have to fail out of krishna consciousness fail out of krishna consciousness means we decide i want to do something and if i'm not able to do it i just give it up say i want to fast on ekadashi if i can't fast then i can take a little food and continue my bhakti but instead If I can't fast, then I will eat with compound interest <laughs> to make up for all the eating that I have not done. <laughs> so that is undesired. So you say, okay, I can't be conscious of Krishna this way, and I can be conscious of this way. So generally, when great characters are involved in scripture, it is always good to have a deferential attitude, a respectful attitude. That even if they do some mistake, the result ultimately is that they become devoted more and more. so it's like if an ordinary person jumps down from a 100 story building no probably they just uh, they even their bones will be difficult to find and count but if an action movie a uh, superstar jumps down from a 100 story building uh, there is already a safety net below and when that superstar jumps down at that time there are multiple video cameras shooting that action and that action 
will be broadcast in movie theaters across the world. So when some characters in scripture they do something wrong, that is like that superstar jumping down from a high rise building. Whereas if we do something wrong, it's like an ordinary person jumping down. So we shouldn't bring them down to our level. We should rather see that they, there is something special going on over there. It may be that they are in Yoga Maya and everything is orchestrated by Krishna. It may be that they are in Mahamaya, but because they have a, uh, they have a repentant attitude thereafter, so Krishna uses even their actions which are done in Mahamaya for his purposes. So Krishna is so expert that he can bring good even out of someone's mistakes. But sometimes just the force of the condition or conditioning may make us do some mistakes. So, but if we repeat that mistake by becoming frustrated and becoming further alienated from Krishna, then that is bad. That is unfortunate. But okay, one mistake happened. As soon as we realize it, we try to do course correction. That's what Brahmaji did. When he did that, Krishna can bring good even out of our mistakes. Thank you very much. Thank you, Brahmaji, for yet another wonderful class.